In the early part of the Cold War, the United States had a serious problem. Gathering intelligence on the Soviet Union was proving incredibly difficult to do. Several attempts to establish intelligence networks behind the Iron Curtain had been violently put down, and a number of American and British spies, along with local collaborators, had met their ends at the hands of Soviet counterintelligence forces. Penetrating the Iron Curtain was proving all but impossible, and while the Americans were relatively new to the spy game, the Soviets were seasoned veterans that ran rings around the CIA. Gathering intelligence on Soviet nuclear weapons was critical. How many did they have? Where were they located? How fast could they be deployed? And what was their maximum range? In these early decades of the Cold War, the world hung on the edge of nuclear war, and knowing its enemy could prove to be the only thing that would save the United States, or at least mitigate the damage of an all-out nuclear exchange. Yet human operatives were routinely failing in their mission or winding up dead. Recognizing that they still had a lot to learn from their Soviet counterparts about spying, the US turned to the one area that it was superior to the Soviet Union in for an answer, technology. Immediately after World War II, the US, Britain, and the Soviet Union all scrambled to get their hands on all the Nazi technology they could. Along with their brilliant engineers and scientists, given the United States liberal society and deep animosity between Germans and communists, most German scientists, however, opted to turn themselves into American authorities willingly, and the Soviets were largely forced to resort to kidnapping or threats to get their hands on high-value Germans. The influx of German talent to the US and the lure of American liberal culture to a world decimated by war and pitted between dictatorships and communist regimes helped bring other great minds to American shores, and soon the US was leapfrogging the Soviet Union technologically in several key areas. One of those areas was in the design of high-performance aircraft. While the Soviets were always the superior rocket scientists, American talent for aircraft was unmatched anywhere in the world. One of those minds, the legendary Kelly Johnson, would bring the world to the most technologically advanced aircraft in the world. Putting his mind to the United States' intelligence gathering problem, Johnson went to work on a spy plane with the endurance to overfly the Soviet Union and photograph Soviet military bases, then return this critical intelligence for analysis. Not only had the Soviets fallen behind in aircraft and jet engine design, they'd also fallen behind in the development of radar technology. Knowing this, Johnson developed the U-2 spy plane, a slow but extremely high-flying plane that could fly over much of the Soviet Union and remain completely out of reach of Soviet fighter planes and missiles both. Taking flight for the first time in 1955, the U-2 soon proved its worth as it boldly flew into Soviet airspace, en route from West Germany to photograph the submarine base in Leningrad. As the U-2 slowly tracked its way across international waters and began to penetrate Soviet airspace, American officials waited with bated breath. Soviet radar may have been less advanced than American radar, but even their ground stations would have easily detected the incoming U-2 from dozens of miles away. Intercepted radio communications told US officials that Soviet interceptors were in the air and rapidly approaching the incoming U-2. Flying at just a few hundred miles an hour and equipped with zero weapons, the U-2 was utterly defenseless. Flying at 70,000 feet, the Americans were alarmed when it became clear that not only had the Soviet radar spotted the U-2, but had actually been able to intermittently track its course. This was a stunning revelation to American planners, who had believed that Soviet radar would be unable to accurately track such a high-flying target for any amount of time. Not only was this assumption now clearly false, but in fact turned out that the Soviet radar may have actually been a little better than American radar. Worried officials nevertheless approved the continuation of the mission, and the U-2 continued to fly toward its target in Leningrad. Though unable to accurately track the U-2 for long, Soviet ground stations nonetheless were able to guide interceptors toward the U-2. Unable to do anything about the incoming fighters, the U-2's pilot stayed on course, his faith in the assurance granted him by Kelly Johnson, the man behind the U-2. MiG-17s were soon within range, and their pilots pitched their noses up to gain the altitude needed to successfully fire on the helpless American plane. Yet their planes only had a service ceiling of 54,000 feet, and their inferior air-to-air -air missiles couldn't bridge the gap to the U-2. One by one, the Soviet planes climbed only to stall out as their engines flared out and then tumble out of the sky. Having avoided the MiG threat, Soviet air defense stations received an order to fire on the American plane. Within minutes, a half dozen surface-to-air missiles rose screaming into the air, gunning directly for a plane so fragile that a too steep turn would rip the wings off the fuselage. Yet, as with the MiGs, the U-2 was too high up to touch, and Soviet missiles expended all of their fuel trying to reach 70,000 feet. 
and then fell to Earth. The U-2 was a success, and the U.S. could now overfly the Soviet Union to gather critical intelligence on everything from number of bombers to missile silos with complete impunity. The Kremlin was furious, and if they were mad about the multiple U-2 incursions throughout the mid-50s, then they were even more angry when an American U-2 flew directly over Moscow. So many interceptors were being sent to try and shoot down the American planes that the photographs the U-2 took were often littered with Soviet aircraft tumbling out of the sky. The U.S. restricted the flights of the U-2, not wishing to risk a provocation to war. The Americans believed that the Soviets would simply accept that they could not stop the U-2, and while they lodged many diplomatic complaints, they never publicly acknowledged the incursions on the world stage for fear of international embarrassment. American assumptions about the Soviets would prove terribly wrong, however, when on May 1, 1960, a Soviet surface-to-air missile brought down a U-2 on a mission over the Soviet Union. The Soviets had caught up to American technology and, in a matter of a few short years, dramatically improved their missile technology, and yet the U.S. still desperately needed the critical intelligence that the U-2 had offered. With this intelligence, America had an unparalleled strategic advantage over the Soviet Union and knew the layout of its military forces almost as well as the Soviets did themselves. The shooting down of the American U-2 was now an official intelligence disaster, and the U.S. needed a solution. Already in development before the shootdown of the U-2 in 1960, Kelly Johnson redoubled his efforts on the development of a brand new spy plane. The Soviets proved they could track and shoot down a U-2, so Johnson's answer was simple. We'll just go faster than their missiles. A lot faster. Johnson had for a few years been working on a new ultra-secret prototype airplane. Jet fighters and bombers were still a relatively new development, having been operational in significant numbers for about a decade, and now Johnson was designing a jet-powered plane that was decades ahead of anything else in the sky. Experimenting with a few variants for different mission types, Johnson's secret and very futuristic plane finally settled on a role as a reconnaissance aircraft, and the first SR-71 took to the sky on December 22, 1964. On its first flight, the plane reached an incredible speed of Mach 3.4, and it immediately became apparent that the U.S. had the tool it desperately needed to keep tabs on the Soviets. Four years later, the SR-71 flew its first operational sortie, penetrating into North Vietnam and revealing hidden Vietnamese bases. Two weeks later, American forces had destroyed them. The SR-71 continued to fly deep into North Vietnam, and soon the North Vietnamese and their Soviet advisors grew wise to the airspace incursions. Not a true stealth aircraft, the SR-71 nonetheless had stealthy features designed to make it more difficult to spot and successfully track. The first incursions into North Vietnam were disregarded by the Vietnamese radar operators and their Soviet advisors as being artifacts or equipment malfunctions. Nothing in the world could be flying at that high and that fast to be real. Yet the SR-71 was very real, and flying at three times the speed of sound from an incredible altitude of 80,000 feet. After several of these radar glitches, it was clear that something was going on in the skies above North Vietnam. The damned Americans were at it again. On July 26, 1968, Vietnamese air defense stations tracked an incoming SR-71. The problem for ground radar was that the plane was fast, blazingly fast. And this fact combined with stealthy characteristics of its design meant that by the time the radar contact was made, it was typically too late to fire a missile. Nevertheless, on this day the Vietnamese tried, firing Soviet-made surface-to-air missiles at the incoming plane. The crew was immediately alerted by their missile warning indicator and followed standard missile avoidance protocol, go faster. The plane accelerated to about Mach 3.3, and the crew held their breaths. Would Kelly Johnson's plane truly outfly a supersonic missile? In moments, they had their answer, and Flight 976 went on its way completely unharmed. On their return journey back to base, they overflew the same SAM site and were fired on again to the same effect. Later analysis of the terrain tracking camera footage revealed that the nearest missile had exploded a full mile behind the big black plane. The SR-71 could officially outfly missiles. Soon, SR-71 flights took place over the Soviet Union itself, and frustrated Soviet officials found themselves in the same position they were back in the late 50s. All of their secrets lay bare and exposed for the Americans to photograph from the sky, and they were utterly helpless to stop them. Salvos of SAMs were fired at the incoming planes, but each time the pilot simply stepped on the gas and outran the missiles. To avoid interception, the SR-71 was equipped with a radar jammer, which would make it difficult to lock onto the plane once in range. This difficulty was further compounded by the stealthy features of the big plane's body, 
and together effectively lowered tracking and target acquisition range to just a few dozen miles. Even at these ranges though, a radar on the ground may spot the SR-71 but would not have a high enough resolution lock to successfully guide missiles to target. The incredible speed of the SR-71 then allowed it to simply blaze over the surface-to-air installation and any missiles fired would spend all their energy on just reaching the 80,000-foot altitude the plane flew at and then simply fall back to Earth. Soviet interceptors proved no better at the job than their surface-to-air batteries did. Most of them simply lacked the ability to even get high enough to threaten the SR-71 in the first place. To solve the issue and to counter the threat of secret American supersonic bomber programs, Soviet designers created the MiG-25. In essence, the MiG-25 was nothing more than a rocket with wings and included very few avionics. Despite being highly touted by the Soviets, the reality was that the plane could operate only as an interceptor, and even then, it had an effective combat radius of under 200 miles. The max operating altitude of the plane was just below the SR-71, which in theory would allow for interception, but the plane could not fly faster than Mach 2.5 or it would destroy its engines. The only hope for a MiG-25 to intercept the SR-71 would be if it somehow managed to get an early enough warning to line up a head-on shot at the SR-71. And even then, its missiles would fail to compensate for the incredible closing rate of the SR-71 and had no hope of hitting it. When the MiG-25 proved ineffective, the Soviets doubled down and developed the MiG-31. A vastly improved interceptor, the MiG-31 had much greater range and operational altitude and was theoretically capable of intercepting an SR-71. In fact, at least a dozen peaceful intercepts near Soviet airspace were carried out during the 1980s and all of these when Washington had hoped to improve relations with the Soviet Union by ceasing operations inside its airspace. These intercepts led many to believe that the SR-71 had met its match. Yet in reality, even the MiG-31 was unlikely to intercept an SR-71 except in the most favorable conditions, and even then it would need quite a bit of luck. In order for the MiG-31 to successfully intercept the SR-71, it would require the coordination of several aircraft to cover all approach vectors, thus increasing the odds that at least one would be at the right incoming direction for the SR-71. The MiG-31 would still stall out trying to get to the same altitude as an SR-71 and typically would only get within 10,000 feet, not nearly close enough for a guaranteed missile intercept. Only by being directly in the path of an incoming SR-71 could the MiG-31 hope to shoot one down, and even then it was doubtful. The extreme altitude meant that any missiles fired would have a very difficult time maneuvering as they rely on fins to adjust their course as they fly through the air. The very low temperatures also affected the proximity fuses on the missiles and made it unlikely that it would detonate in time to damage the aircraft. On top of this, the SR-71 itself was armed with defensive countermeasures that included jammers and the low radar reflectivity only confounded problems for an incoming missile. The most optimal launch envelope for an enemy fighter would actually be to get directly behind the SR-71 where heat-seeking missiles could lock onto the engines. But again, with the MiG-31 unable to keep up with the SR-71 speed, this was an extremely unlikely thing to happen. Even the peacetime intercepts that the MiG-31 carried out on the SR-71 were only ever truly possible because the SR-71's flight route was well known to the Soviets. Had the SR-71 truly wanted to penetrate Soviet airspace, it would have taken an unpredictable approach vector, and it would have been up to blind luck for the MiGs to be in the right place to take their shot. In the end, the SR-71 served America faithfully for over 30 years, and despite over a thousand missiles fired at it, not a single SR-71 was ever lost to hostile action. Many myths abound over its retirement in the 1990s, with most people believing that advances in Russian interceptors and missiles put the SR-71 at risk, or that spy satellites were able to do the job of an SR-71 and it was no longer needed. These assumptions are both tacitly false, as there still doesn't exist a plane that is truly capable of ensuring a successful interception of an SR-71, and while useful, spy satellites can take up to 24 hours to get over a target area and have a predictable route in the sky which allows an enemy to hide whatever they don't want seen when the satellite is overhead. In truth, the SR-71 was cancelled due to shifting budget priorities by US lawmakers. In a world without the Soviet Union, few believed that the SR-71 was necessary anymore, and budgets increasingly went to the development of the B-2 bomber and UAVs. Today though, with the rise of China and Russia's renewed belligerence, a successor to the SR-71 is now in testing and is rumored to hit speeds as high as Mach 6. 
Without a doubt the finest aerospace engineer in history, Kelly Johnson designed and built the world's greatest spy plane, and even today, decades after his death, the SR-71 remains unparalleled in capability. Why do you think the SR-71 was really cancelled? Do we have a need for spy planes today? Let us know in the comments, and as always if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.